this open forum on video games, the metaverse, and NFTs. We have a great panel lineup for you today and want to get right into it. We've got some excellent experts from um, who've been thinking about these topics uh, and who have experience with them as well, um, as well as colleagues from the World Intellectual Property Organization. We're very pleased to bring you this open forum today. My name is Michelle Woods. I'll be the moderator, but uh, we'll try to interject myself as little as possible into the proceedings so we can spend as much time as possible with our experts. We do plan to leave some time at the end of the program for questions, for comments. We will try to monitor those. Please uh, be active in trying to intervene when we get to that point, and we'll do our best to recognize those both in the room and who are joining remotely. So, um, as we are still trying to add one speaker, I think we will go directly to Gaetano Demita and ask him to start us off on the context here um, in terms of video game developments and what we see generally in this area of the law. So, Gaetano, over to you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Let me start saying that it's a real honor to be here, and 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 I I, I was so excited because you asked me to talk about my my favorite topic. So I'll try to be brief. I'll try to be concise. I I really want to hear from from Michaela and Andreas, and I hope we can have a, a chance at the end to discuss with the with the audience if they have any question or any comments because it's a it's a very exciting time. Uh, I've been uh, uh, working, doing research, teaching on uh, interactive entertainment law and more generally video games for, for over a decade. But uh, recently, in the last few years, uh, uh, it really exploded. And I have to show my bias because I am an IP lawyer and I live in an IP bubble and I love video games. You can see my, my, my background. <laughs> and uh, this has been uh, uh, magic from, uh, from a researcher, from an academic point of view because there is an increased recognition of, of, of the importance, not only economic importance, but the importance for IP in general and the way we approach IP and uh, the impact on society and culture as a whole of this amazing creative industry. I'm not going to share numbers because whatever, w w whichever survey or data you collect, uh, the numbers are different, the, the methodology of collecting this number is different, but let's say can we say like almost half of the population plays video games? We don't have data from a, a few major countries, but it's not, uh, it's not the 80s anymore. Now, you, you can publicly admit you play video game and you're passionate about this form of creation. Video games started appearing not only in video game museums, but also in museums around the world because it's recognized very important for, for how we live and how we approach our interaction with each other. And I guess the pandemic also showed that video games can be also a force for good because uh, to some extent, they, they kept us sane. People playing video games had less uh, issue with the isolation of the various lockdowns we had all around the globe. But let me focus on the AP part, and plus I'm here just for an introduction to, uh, to, to Michael and Andreas that are going to get deep into the topic. Video games from an IP perspective are probably the most fascinating subject matter of, of IP. Uh, I, 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 I constantly tell my students like uh, IP on steroids. Our very rich intellectual property environment and their environment, and this is the main difference with the uh, other subject matter of IP protection, that you have to interact with and you have to immerse yourself in. So it involves a relationship between the subject matter and the player that can create IP. We saw the explosion of esports, we saw the explosion of, of channels like Twitch, in which people simply creating, simply playing, are actually creating other form of IP. And, th and this is fascinating because uh, I IP, I do believe, but of course I'm biased, <laughs> I'm here, is the blood and soul or, 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 or our societies there to protect our most sacred creation. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's something great. And, and, and the economy is actually showing that uh, IP-based economy are, uh, tend to be strong, even in situations in which the world, situation, the world uh, economics are, are, are struggling. When you look at video games, you always have to consider the entire 
package of, uh, of intellectual property. Uh, and intellectual property are uh, jurisdictional based, they, they are different in, in, in subject matter protection and limitation exception. And this shows how complex this already complex subject matter protection product or services that are enriched by a very complex and, and global and international licensing frameworks and obey to a very third level of complexity layer of, of global regulation, it is an industry we have to observe. It is an industry that most of the time we have to, to, to learn from because most of the issues that are becoming and uh, are mainstream today have been video game issue for two decades. So the video game industry had to deal with a lot of the fundamental con uh, questions that we have today for over two decades. I'm not saying they, they solved all the problem or they, they, they went for the correct approach in, in all the situation, but it's something they're familiar with. It is a young industry, is born digital, is extremely successful. So that means they, they, they get sued <laughs> sometimes. And, and they're global. They're highly creative, highly innovative, and I don't know if it's because they are young, but uh, they are not afraid to take risks. There is a lot of uh, do it first and ask question later uh, kind of approach with dealing with, with, the, uh, with the most difficult question to answer. Most of the time, the video game company is launching something entirely new. It's there for the first time. And... Uh, not even uh, the, the best practitioner or the best academics can give a yes or no answer. I mean, in IP and in when dealing with lawyers, it's quite common to get a depends as, as an answer. <laughs> there are a lot of depends in, in, in video game question. But while we're talking about video games in connection to the metaverse and, and, and NFTs, probably because of this reason, the industry is so fast forward that uh, uh, we can use them as scannery in a mine. <laughs> so we can actually observe them in order to understand what the trend could be. Of course, prediction is always better not to do pre any prediction when you're being recorded. <laughs> but uh, we, can, we can understand where the trend, where the direction is, the thing that work, the thing that uh, probably are not going to work. And whenever it is a technological advancement, it's also important to remember that video games is actually one of the two ways we actually embrace and start using new technologies. It's normally coming from something that they force you to do at work or something, or something that you buy because you want to play a video game with. Generally, the most expensive piece of technology we have at home is what we, we play video games on. But more generally, and this has been pointed out uh, uh, a number of times, video games are also the first um, interaction that we have outside of our family circle. So it can also be used to understand how social interaction works in an observable environment. Uh, one of the common sentences is generally the first uh, uh, license you sign, the first contract you sign is an end user license agreement of a video game. And the first and the first money you spend is probably uh, on a video games. Nowadays, also the first money you earn might be because a YouTube video that that, 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 that is generating income. So the impact on how we relate to each other, how we relate and understand the law uh, is really important. And also they have a transnational nature. I mean, when you play a video game, you're joining an environment that is beyond uh, borders. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, the law is, is, is national. So you can actually uh, export concept outside of your national jurisdiction if it's done properly by designing them within video games. Not only they are the canary of the mines for a lot of legal issue, but they're also for the specific topic of today, uh, the first industry that are been actually looking at it from a more established point, established point of view. Most of the successful, uh, okay, successful is an idea. Most of the proto metaverse that people actually play <laughs> and enjoy. Uh, they, they tend to come from, from video games. They, they are basically video games. And they're also the one that already integrated, to so understand, a form of a, uh, a entertainment with a social media aspect of including and governing a community. 
but they're also the most apt. I mean, they are technologically based uh, industry to use and to experiment on new monetization model and new form of, but I don't want to use words that maybe Andreas is going to explain better later on, illusion of property, <laughs> illusion of, 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 of ownership, because there is this strong connection with the video game that you play. I leave Andreas to, 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 to go technical and, and, and to tell us the truth. But uh, there is this sensation. We, we deal with virtual items. We deal with uh, um, things that we don't actually own a lot in video games, starting from the video game per se that, that, that you buy. That goes with other points that Michaela probably is going to do later on how perception, especially when it comes to IP, uh, it is really important because it's impacting on, on on us and on us. I mean, not the researcher in in video games and IP, but on us, the the general public, the the citizen of of this planet. And uh, I'm conscious of time. This is meant to be just an introduction to the use, but I want to leave you with one of the things I think is really important. We're moving into an environment in which IP is the core of everything. And uh, we live in this environment, we're going to have IP and we're going to have a very complex contract layers. It is very important that we keep our attention on intellectual property because intellectual property is going to create the constitution of these virtual environments, the constitution of wherever we are going to log, log in in 10 years. And IP is also the only uh, protection that we have to some extent to uh, a world in which everything is regulated by tort and contract and where there is uh, not much space for our freedom, democracy, and civil liberties. IP can actually save us. <laughs> and uh, on that, I totally declare my bias. And I guess uh, I'll pass it back to Michelle <laughs> as the moderator. Great. Well, um, I can see we're getting into some interesting uh, areas here with uh, that uh, start off. So thank you so much, uh, Gaetano. And let's go to our next speaker, uh, Michaela, Micaela Mantegna, who will focus for us on the metaverse aspects of the development of video games and what we're seeing there. She's a great expert in this field, and I very much look forward to her comments. Micaela, over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you so much, Gatano, for the introduction. Sorry that I am in Argentina, I'm based in Argentina, and I'm having, of course, we are in the Internet Governance Forums, and of course, I have trouble with my Wi-Fi, my Internet. And that's what the problem is when we are talking about the metaverse and talking about digital realities. And if you're going to be based into uh, the metaverse, this is going to be something that to consider how we access the metaverse. Let me share my screen one for one moment so we can. Um, here we go. Can you see the screen? Yes. No, yes, yes, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Uh, one of the things we share here, oh, all the panelists and, and I assume the, the public, is our love for video games. And I share Gatano's enthusiasm about video games leading the way into the methods. And another thing that is really important is to consider that video games are one of the few, if not the only, uh, interactive media that allows you to experience empathy in a different way because of the uh, um, interactivity of, of the nature of the stories and the narratives, it's really important to understand that we can actually feel the stories and feel the experiences in a different way. And this is something really important if we are talking about the metaverse because it's going to be an interactive environment and also a tool to create communities. Um, let me go quick. Uh, Gaetano did some introduction about uh, how do we arrive to this concept of the metaverse that until not so much was considered something like really far-fetched from sci-fi uh, and pop culture. And the metaverse, and this is one of the first misconceptions, people talking about the metaverse as something new. The metaverse is in fact uh, turning 30 this year. Uh, it started as a term in the, in the book Snow Crash by Neil Stephenson. And uh, Neil Stephenson also clarifies in that book 
that there were other developments that and other uses of the term. Uh, but uh, we have seen different elements, the key elements of the metaverse. And I see Michelle smiling, so I assume she loves Star Trek as much of us uh, do here. Uh, there are some elements of the metaverse in different aspects of um, pop culture and video games. For example, uh, if you remember the holodeck from Star Trek, these kind of interactive rooms where you can create different realities. And this is like the ultimate goal and aspiration of creating a metaverse, a completely fully immersive interactive environment we can, where we can touch, smell, uh, see, uh, hear, or our senses are going to be engaged. Uh, another philosophical uh, predecessor to the, the things we are talking today is the matrix and talking about particularly the perception of reality, simulation theory for those who like philosophy, and also the economic incentives of these kind of digital economies. And for the more uh, young people, uh, you might remember Ready Player One, which is based in a book. And also for me, from an IP perspective, you know that everyone here in the room is kind of an IP geek. One of the things I remember interestingly about this book is like the clashing of licenses because you can see uh, characters from different uh, corporations all mixed together. And this is something that is really core to what the metaverse is and something that you also are seeing in video games as well. When Fortnite, you can have like an avatar from a star, um, I'm going to say Star Trek, but not Star Wars. Uh, and also this next to them could be Ariana Grande or Batman. So it's interesting to see this kind of coalition and clashing of licenses and also putting your IP in the hands of people through the avatars, which uh, in video games is something that we call sometimes user-generated content. And is something interesting because corporations were kind of weary before these to allow people to kind of interact in that way with their IP. And something that I think really interesting, uh, find interesting about this is you compare, for example, what has been happening with how Disney uh, kind of interacts with their IP and the public. And on the other uh, hand, how do you see the minions and how the, the, the owners of this IP had allowed the public to interact in a different way to kind of recreate and do things. And that has allowed their popularity to grow. So these are kind of hints of, that can allow us to forecast what can happen in the future with, with this. Also, uh, the metaverse come from gaming. You might remember Second Life, one of the proto-metaverses that Gaetano was talking about, and more recently, Animal Crossing during the pandemic that allow us to connect and continue our social relationships online, Roblox, Minecraft. But the thing is, what is the metaverse? And to this point, we have different and several uh, concepts and terminology about that, but in reality, there is no consensus about it. But we can say that it's the next uh, next evolution of video games and the next evolution of the internet. At the same time, mixing different elements of social media, internet, and platforms, but also adding an element of spatial computing in we that will allow us to manipulate and interact with these three digital objects. So my definition is kind of a work in progress, and we can talk about the metaverse as a conversion, a conversion of digital and physical realities on software and hardware, but also it's not just technology, but it's also the human component and, and the anthropological component of how do we relate with each other. So if we are talking about different uh, technologies, we can see that depending on who you ask, they are going to be elements of blockchain or neurotechnology as the future of interfaces, artificial intelligence. And something we are going to talk about a bit today is how generative artificial intelligence is a key element of the metaverse. And when we are talking about how the, this reality mix, this is something I have been researching and working on that I call the reality gradient because we tend to think about VR, XR as different things uh, or kind of an umbrella. But the thing is like, we are not going to be one moment in VR and then in AR and we are going to notice the difference. 
where we are heading is a state that we are going to transition gradually from one state to the other, adding or, or subtracting different artificial senses, because our, our sense of uh, hearing would be replaced for artificial sound or maybe our visuals. So it's going to be integrating different elements of that. And as we were saying before, the, the, the kind of the goal of this is achieving haptic and um, all kind of like a really super immersive uh, reality in, in the far end of the spectrum. So uh, this is kind of a more uh, academic definition that I have uh, been working on. If you want to read, I, I happy to share, here's, here's the link. Uh, but the thing is like I was saying, generative AI is a fundamental shift in creativity on how we think about creativity, which is a high uh, kind of like one of the main components of, of copyright law, thinking about originality and creativity. And this is going to be a metaverse cornerstone because if you are thinking about these virtual worlds, and you probably have been reading news about some proto metaverses that uh, um, there is nobody in there, it's like big structures and big investments, but nobody is there. And one of the things I always say is like the, the, the race for the metaverse is going to be won not only by the best graphics, but the best communities. And this is another lesson from video games. Uh, as Gatana was saying, video games create relationships between people and people might not like the graphics, but they're going to stay if you have your friends there. Uh, uh -huh. See chat? Uh, a question, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be uh, wary of the time. So Michelle, you, you make a sign if I'm overstepping. But the thing is, we are living in this era of AI creativity where we can, in seconds, create masterpieces. Uh, and this is opening really interesting and new questions because we can not only create uh, like only like images or paintings as you might have been seeing with Dali or Midjourney, but these techniques can be applied to any single type of creative content. And this is. To we started talking about generative artificial intelligence, talking about one particularly arch particular architecture that was called GANS, Generative Arbitrary Networks. And now in just like a few years, we have evolved into models that are able to create, as we were seeing, really interesting images in just seconds. And you can see these models through uh, DALI, Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey where we start with a random pattern of dots and we are kind of diffusing, up. it's a process of kind of matching a text, let's say like, like a simple explanation, matching a text and matching a, an image and creating like a map of possible images that correlates to that semantic, uh, that, that semant semantic text. And the thing is that this is just the tip of the iceberg because we are seeing these beautiful images created to mid journey and kind of these impossible uh, anim um, uh, landscapes. But we is this is just static. But Nvidia and other corporations are working in transforming these static environments into dynamic and three D animated objects. So this is uh, get three D which is kind of like the DALI for the metaverse from, for NVIDIA. Uh, and they're trying to make it possible to create animated uh, virtual objects, shots from text. As, as we have text to image, we're going to have text to animation. Uh, Meta also presented make a video when you can create an, an illustration and then an animation. And this is interesting because well, we have been talking about uh, artificial intelligence for years, but now we need to talk really deep about artificial creativity and the challenges that it poses to IP, because IP was based on, on scarcity rationales about how would you think about the creation and the integration of our cultural uh, knowledge. And the thing is, these uh, these developments allow us to create really massive and, and quick and producing a volume of works that humans cannot compete with. So this is like, this is posing really interesting questions. Uh, and we have been thinking about originality and creativity and what does it mean for a work to be original? And the thing is, now we cannot notice the difference. We cannot say by just looking at some piece of art, it was if it was machine made or, or human made. And at the end of the day, is it going to matter that? 
And another interesting thing about this, how this is going to impact the public domain, because if we start thinking about registration and allow registration of machine created works, this can increase the, the, the amount of works uh, that are under copyright protection and create some imbalances and uh, towards the public domain. So for the metaverse, it's going to be really interesting because as we were saying, these worlds need to be populated and it will be a mix of human creativity and, and human uh, ingenuity. But at the same time, we need to create at a massive scale that only generative AI can provide. And copyright is in the middle of this and has a lot of questions to talk about uh, that has a huge impact in how we consider the future of work and the future of creation. And I, I don't want to overstep on my time. So if you can find me here and we can continue the conversation. I, I'm, I'm a super geek of both IP and, and video games. So <laughs> just reach me out here. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And you gave us so many things to continue to talk about. And I'm sure that Andres Guadamus, our next speaker, is going to pick up on some of those themes and then lead us a little more in depth into the topic of NFTs and how that uh, intersects with you, this universe. So Andres, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just going to try to share my screen and hopefully I can uh resize and do the right yeah um now i that should resize yes i think now i have it uh fine uh thanks very much again for the invitation um and for the very very uh excellent presentations before by michaela and uh um, and gaetano who have introduced the subject now i'm going to take us a little bit into the metaverse and end up with NFTs. Uh, so try to bring everything together because one of the things that I want to do is bring us into property. What is property like? What is going to be property in the metaverse if there is such a thing? And that is potentially going to involve some form of tokens. So I'll try to explain where I'm coming from. Um, I think that what we're seeing right now is um, a confluence of technologies that are potentially going to change the way in which we interact, we create, we mediate with media. Um, there is uh, the, the potential of generative AI, the potential of immersive um, environments, and potentially also the um, use of tokenization um, to mediate our, our interaction with all of these things. So we are living in a almost, you could say, a golden age of uh, te technological advances, particularly with in, in the field of artificial intelligence. However, I also come to you with a bit of a warning. Uh, I, I, I'm usually, um, I, I, I like to, to have this as one of my presentation slides. Um, <laughs> There is always a danger that we are going to look at the hype and get lost in the buzzwords. And my goodness, I have a presentation that has the words metaverse and NFTs together. So it couldn't, I, I, I think it, it just needs artificial intelligence and cloud or, or something else for this to be even more buzzwordy. So I bring you a little bit of a warning to try to be careful about not overdoing the hype. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail uh, on, on, on the definitions of metaverse. Uh, Michaela had, did a, an excellent job on this. However, um, I would agree that we don't really have a definition. And I think uh, over the, the next couple of years, we, we have to come up with and workable definition. If we define it as virtual uh, reality, augmented reality, 3D spaces, games, chat rooms, um, all of these things already exist and have existed since the 1990s. One of the jokes that I always say is that a viewmaster is pretty much like the metaverse if you define it that way. If you don't know what a viewmaster is, um, uh, don't worry, uh, ask your granddad, uh, your granddad. Okay, so uh, my own definition, which is uh, um, sort of similar to, to Michaela's is uh, 
uh, um, I'm looking at a persistent virtual 3D space that allows people to interact with one another. How they interact, if it is a game environment, this is a social environment, it's going to be a different different question. Um, I am skeptical a little bit. I've been um, writing that the metaverse doesn't, doesn't exist, which is um, sometimes a little bit um, trying to be a little bit um, um, uh, let's say skeptical. However, let's assume that I'm wrong. Let's assume that the metaverse actually exists and is going. It actually takes off. So, what type of metaverse are we going to get? And I promise we'll eventually get to NFTs. There is a, a reason why I have all of this in, uh, introduction. So, um, assume that it takes off. Uh, what would it look like? Uh, I like to use media to sort of explain um concepts so i like to think that we could get what i call the ready player one metaverse in which one company wins the uh, we won't mention which company but let's say assume one company is the one that wins the race therefore the metaverse that we're going to get is that company's version of the metaverse okay um uh they're going to own pretty much everything that, that is, if you if you watched or read Ready Player One, um, that is what the internet is. It, it's owned by one company, which is actually a nightmare from a regulator perspective, but that's a different question. Um, then we have the potential of what I call the Ralph Breaks the Internet uh, Metaverse, which is different platforms. By the way, fantastic movie. Um, it's it, it, different platforms that interact um, with one another uh, through um, a similar uh, sort of uh, standard or um, connected through protocols, very similar protocols. So you have different metaverses that can potentially interact with one another. And then we have what I would like to call the multiverse of madness uh, metaverse, which every metaverse is completely incompatible with another. And then you have to jump, probably get... Um, a superhero to allow you to jump from one to the other. Um, spoiler alert. Okay. Um, what we're talking about when, uh, from a property perspective, when we're dealing with the metaverse and property is digital assets. So the concept itself for digital assets is not new. Uh, we've had this, we already have it. We've had... Um, digital assets in everyday life in the form of uh, currency, music, the old time MP3s. Uh, but, but when we think about it, our interaction with technology nowadays uh, takes place with what we understand as digital assets in all sorts of forms. So the deployment of pervasive environments will require us to sort of grapple with the legal issues surrounding digital assets. Are there property? Are there intellectual property? Um, do they have an interface with inter intellectual property? Some things I would argue that they do, but it's more important who owns the platform. And here is where we start analyzing and looking at property. Um, now, I would argue that in the metaverse, there is, for the most part, there is no IP, there is only contract. And Gaetano uh, explained that already. Um, our interaction with an environment is going to be completely mediated through us signing an end user license agreement, and everything is handled through the ULS. So uh, I always like to say, if it's not your server, it's not your property. If you have anything, anyone can cut access to your property. Um, it comes from not your keys, not your uh, not your bitcoins, but uh, I, I think it's a very similar concept. If you are do not own the the, the servers, and someone can flip the switch, and it, this applies for absolutely everything. So decentralized and open models, and this is where we will eventually get to NFTs, uh, may start to come in. However, roughly speaking, we are dealing with three property models when dealing with the, uh, with the metaverse. So there is the private and closed model. Um, everything is in the metaverse, and that belongs to one company that gives you the service. So that could be Roblox, Meta, 
whatever definition that we have. So again, not your server, not your property. Uh, this is the most common in virtual worlds, in MMOs, in games, um, in, in, in virtual spaces, uh, where you are meet, you're interacting with your property through uh, um, through a and user license agreements. Um, you may have items in game in, in a game or in the virtual space. You may own a house, you may own an avatar, you may own uh, mounts, uh, gear, all sorts of things, but you don't really own them. They are uh, part of your end user license agreement. So there is no property on any anything. There is, however, an open model of the metaverse, which it would be, this is very rare, but it it used to be very common in Second Life, which to my surprise, it already exists. It, 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 it still exists since 2006 or something. Um, so usually you create goods and they're licensed through Creative Commons. So actually you own some things, but again, even the open model relies on uh, using other people's server. So it's very rare. It, other than Second Life, I don't, I haven't seen many places where it exists. Um, this is where we get to metaverse. So the third model, the third property model, is the use of what is understood as Web three. Web one was the early web of the nineteen nineties, um, pretty much unidirectional. Web two is the social media, user generated content uh, web. The web three is supposed to be the tokenized web in which everything that we do, we interact with uh, some form of uh, tokens. So usually we're going to have decentralized services uh, connected through wallets, cryptocurrencies, and particularly NFTs. Uh, those all of these digital assets supposedly are interchangeable. We can take them with us from one metaverse to the other. So that is the idea. That is the selling point of this Web three metaverse. Um, it doesn't matter if you get disconnected or your server or your service uh, is brought down. You still have the property in the shape of a token that you can carry with you everywhere. Um, Hi, game developers, by the way, are highly skeptical about this model. Um, you may be wondering, Andres, what do you mean by NFTs? Um, we don't have enough time to go into an in-depth discussion of about NFTs. I know this is a very uh, educated audience, so I'm assuming that a lot of people understand the concept already. What we're talking about usually is fungible goods, that are by definition interchangeable, so grain, gold, things like that. There are non-fungible goods that are things that are unique. So a non-fungible token is a digital cryptocurrency blockchain represented uh, thing. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I've, I've been looking at the, um, at the, I haven't been looking at the chat. Uh, so, um, it's mediated um, through a token, and this token is going to rep to represent a unique item. So, uh, and it's immutable, so the entries on on, on database cannot be changed. Um, Roughly speaking, it looks something like this, uh, to give you an idea. Um, it's just metadata written on the blockchain. If you have a Tezos Explorer uh, and you are fast enough and you want to write down, this is a contract that I created, um, this, is an, this is what an NFT looks like, pretty much. Uh, what we're talking about is uh, tokens that are metadata that represent a digital item, in this case, an artificial intelligence uh, generated uh, image and you can take it with you even if the service that you use to create it um, disappeared. So obviously the idea is that we can have items on the metaverse that um, can interact with one another. So quickly to finish, um, there is now starting to be case law that is going to be decided on this interface between digital assets the metaverse and NFTs. Uh, we just had uh, in, in the last couple of weeks, uh, a very interesting decision uh, in the Barcelona commercial court uh, on an injunction between Vegap, uh, which is sort of the commercial entity, so the, the collecting agency for virtual artists in uh, Spain and Mango, which is a very popular uh, 
Barcelona-based shop of uh, clothing. Uh, Mango created a, uh, an NFT based on uh, four uh, works by Catalonian painters who are still on their copyright. They own the physical works, but they don't own the copyright. Uh, so um, they created clothing based on the paintings and put it on the metaverse. There is a metaverse shop on the central land um, that you can visit. And okay, uh, uh, for another time, uh, just quickly, a VEGAP suit for copyright infringement, the case is ongoing. But what's interesting is that the court decided, okay, we are going to keep this NFT that is potentially infringing, and they ordered an injunction to have custody of the wallet. Um, so fascinating environment that we have now, decisions that have interface of, of, of all of these technologies. And I'll leave you with that. Uh, thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much, Andres. That was fascinating and uh, looking forward to hearing more about that case and development of case law. Before we get into the discussion, I do want to turn to my own colleague and uh, the champion of video games here at WIPO, not the only one, but uh, uh, very much uh, in the lead, uh, Richard Frelick, who will tell us a little bit more about what's going on at WIPO in this area. And I would like to just shout out to a couple of other colleagues who are uh, with us today, I see Paolo Lanteri, Victor Owade. They have been very involved in bringing this program to us. And now over to you, uh, Richard, please. Thanks so much, uh, Michelle. And I, you did exactly what I also wanted to do is to give a shout out to Victor and Paolo. And of course, exactly underlining there are quite a lot of champions on video games in WIPO, which makes it even more exciting for us to continue on this work. Uh, a very good afternoon to Everyone, I'm really pleased to join this event with such amazing speakers. I'm also excited to give you a preview of our upcoming project, uh, Level Up Your IP, a video game developer's quest. So why video games? The previous speakers uh, already said it in many ways, uh, but just to further emphasize, intellectual property is at the, at the heart of the video game industry. From the copyright to the music, stories, visuals, software, to trademarks for the brands, characters, or even slogans, a video game is a treasure trove of intellectual property. Why WIPO? Why the World Intellectual Property Organization? As the Global Forum for Intellectual Property Services, Policy, Information, and Cooperation, we know intellectual property, and we already have an extensive portfolio of activities on video games, ranging from the highly, the highly popular Mastering the Game publication, which gives a detailed overview of almost 400 pages of all things legal and business related to video games, to the recently released uh, PlayStation infographic, or uh, also highly popular study on copyright infringement in the video game industry, and many, many, many more, both trainings as well as studies in this area. So why are we doing this new project? Well, here we want to focus on helping the SME video game developer grow through the better through the better management of their intellectual property, as well as we want to create uh, networking opportunities for big and small companies uh, across different regions of the world. Specifically, in this case, we'll be uh, focusing on Central European and Baltic states, Asia and the Pacific, as well as Latin America and the Caribbean countries. Uh, the dream big end result we want to achieve is we want to contribute to national economic growth in the targeted regions through successful and ip aware video game companies uh, who are we targeting we the main beneficiary are those small and medium-sized studios including indie as well as new game creators and developers so people who are already in the industry and can benefit from a better understanding of those basics of intellectual property additionally for this uh, for the project to be successful we also are targeting of course representatives of large studios publishers consoles platforms video game legal experts in-house lawyers gamers uh, always uh, how do we want to do it? We want to 
do it in a 360 approach around the needs of the game developer. So everything in this project is supposed to be short, selected, and useful straight to the point. The focus is going to be on the business aspects of IP and how legal issues can help out in those. And we will have five levels of content, which will follow the different game development stages uh, of a video game. Uh, and each, I'll come back to the, to the content, but just to say that each of these levels will have uh, four steps. So first one would be the podcast interview with a successful video game company, so ranging from the biggest to the smallest ones, uh, which we will have the objective to also get to find some insights, tips and tricks from the industry on how the these companies are managing their intellectual property. Second, there will be the IP clinics. Those will be these one-on-one -on -one meetings between high profile legal experts internationally recognized with the small video game company. These one-on-one -on -one meetings in 45 minutes to support them in better understanding intellectual property. Then. For those, and we are uh, we are aiming to cover approximately 75 uh, uh, companies from across the world. Uh, then, additionally, we would want to have these informal online networking events where we will also give the opportunity for those companies who could not make it for the clinics to still ask their questions to our experts who are part of this project. And finally, we will also, on each level, issue this level power up, as we call it. This is going to be this just you know one page, one page of a checklist of a for a video game developer for them to, at that stage, go through th those basic things they need to understand on IP at that game development stage. And plus, we also want to have this uh, network very active and uh, engaging network created specifically gr a specific group on LinkedIn. Uh, we are uh, going to be cooperating and partnering with many, many different amazing uh, organizations and people, including associations, federations, publishers, large and small studios, governments, ministries, and IP offices. Uh, while I have to hold on uh, with sharing with you the details of all the amazing companies, legal practitioners, and partners we will be working with, I can already tell you that uh, Two of the experts here today will be joining this project and will be are already actually helping with the development of this project. So Michaela and Getana will be part of the podcast, the networking events, as well as, of course, the content creation. Uh, speaking about the content, uh, the content will, of course, focus on helping that game developer level up their intellectual property. We will be doing that through uh, a level zero introduction kind of session, then level one to five following those game development stages. Just very quickly, level one will have that objective to introduce the quest and the levels, introduce the hosts and experts, and show that at the end of the day, the gaming stories from the project team, because I know all of us are playing World of Warcraft or many other games uh, across different platforms for many, many years. So that is something we also want to emphasize here that is by game this is being done this project is being developed developed by gamers uh moving on to the first level here uh the preparing for the journey and this is going to be I, about the ip and the concept phase so when you're thinking of developing the game what are the main issues you need to understand about intellectual property so for example if you're going to be creating your own ip your own world's characters or should you be uh, licensing that from another media such a comic book or tv show uh level two uh, adventure time this is going to be about all those ip issues that kick in when you're uh, starting to develop the game so the copyright the patents potentially designs and trademarks uh original using original or license uh, engine music licensing architecture and real life uh, just to say that these are not exhaustive lists and this is just some of the issues we would want to touch upon uh, as examples. The launch, level three is the launch uh, as the final destination with a question mark. And here is IP and marketing, marketing brands across the world, IP monitoring and enforcement. Level four uh, is company of players. So here we'll be focusing on, on an, how an IP audit looks like and IP issues during acquisition or investment. And level five, the ones which we're mostly speaking about actually today, um, it's about the new frontiers, uh, not new necessarily technologies, but new wish in a way. Uh, so esports, NFTs, meta metaphors, virtuals, although in this case, we will be most more specifically focusing 
on esports itself. Uh, we're also planning uh, side events, uh, side, and one of them is going to be a training on IP and marketing for women and gaming. Uh, the end of the season kind of event we're thinking of is going to be about IP in your pitch and IP and financing. Uh, so, so when do we start with the whole project? When is the launch? The idea is that we want to have it everything launched in February 7, 2023 with level one following two week cycles of each level. So just to be more illustrative how this will look like, at how a level will look like, it will follow a two week cycle where on Tuesday we're launching the podcast. On Wednesday to Friday, we're opening up the signups for the IP clinics. On Monday, the next, the following week, we have the level power up, this one page checklist made available for each level. Then for Tuesday, uh, from Tuesday to Thursday, we have the IP clinics. And then at the very end, to cover still a reply to any questions we might, uh, the game developers might have, we will have the informal networking event. Uh, summarizing, uh, we look forward to working, welcoming game developers from uh, across the world to join the project, to better understand uh, the basics of IP and expand their global video game network. And I and here, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard, for that quick view of this WIPO initiative. And now uh, we have a little bit of time, not as much as we would like, but there have been some interesting discussions coming up in the chat. Uh, so I do want to bring out some of those points and maybe get some reactions and um, bring others into the conversation. And I think we started with Pedro, who talked about uh, in a question, and um, Pedro, if you're available, if you want to um, pose your question and explain a little bit about your conversation you've been having with Micaela uh, uh, in the chat, that would be great. Um, so I'm really going back here to where you basically said, is metaverse really a thing? Isn't this just a commercially oriented buzzword lumping together different immersive reality technologies? What was your point there? And what uh, is your question to Micaela? Um, to, be, uh, to be very brief, I was just kind of uh, working on a text that Micaela uh, wrote a uh, few months ago that is about Avoiding that the, metaver the metaverse is actually just uh, has, has the same problems that the internet has today about the lack of interoperability, the lack of openness, and how to make it uh, really useful, really new, considering that every time we see a company announcing something about the metaverse, there is just, uh, there's nothing really uh, radically new, there's nothing really transformative in the sense that uh, they are just like uh, new tech, uh, old technologies being reused in a new way, or some technologies that already exists having some new features. So, how can we uh, get this metaverse idea to have something really new, really useful to deserve to being an autonomous, autonomous concept? Great, thank you. And uh, Micaela, I know you responded a little bit in the chat, but uh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, and I would love to invite Andres and Gaetano because I know yes. that we are very much in the same page about this. Uh, but the thing is that people that uh, and we are going, to, I'm going to invoke the, the woman yelling uh, at the cloud at this point, because most of the people that have been working in video games for a long time, uh, we are kind of tired of saying, there is not yet a metaverse, this is virtual wars. When everyone is like uh, pumping up, uh, we created this metaverse and that metaverse. In reality, and, and at least, well, one of the problems is that we don't have a definition and that this is kind of on a fluid state and it's kind of like the internet from the 90s that is like a, a, a mix and match uh, of different aspects. I like to say it's like a bit of Frankenstein because you are piecing things together. and. If we are thinking like methodically and academically about what could make the potentially a metaverse different from uh, existing virtual worlds, for me, at least the key is interoperability. 
And this circle back to the fantastic analogies and points that Andres made with the different versions that we're going to get. Are we going to get the multiverse of madness that everything is clashing <laughs> together? Or are we going to get a unified uh, metaverse? But this is centralization yet again. This is a much broader discussion that is interesting to have in the Internet Governance Forum because part of my background is in Internet Governance. And, and the thing is, this circles back to the revenue models. And for this also, video games can provide a, a really interesting blueprint about this. Because when we talk about video games, we are not talking about surveillance capitalism and data extractivism, because video games have a healthier, not perfect, but healthier business model. And that could also uh, bring a, a, another layer of interesting things to the conversation about Web3 and models and I like to call this sustainability. How are we going to create and sustain the metaverse? And it has to be a, a, like an evolution. And this is something that Pedro was uh, referring to the article that I say that the metaverse is in another aspects, an evolution of capitalism. Because, it, and it ties to what Gatana was saying about everything is going to be IP. And one of my, my uh, how do you say, my forecast about this is like, one of the missing pieces of the conversation is how consumer law is going to interact because we have seen these clashes between IP and consumer law and data protection law. And I think that we need to have like a conversation where all of these moving pieces are talking to each other to create a, a, a state where we can talk about ownership in a different way of what and this connects to what the part of what Andres was saying about how are we going to re-machine ownership when everything is digital. Great. Um, Gaetano, anything on this one? I see you mouthing yeah, no, things. No, I was not even. <laughs> it is amazing. For instance, it, the three people that have been working a lot on, on, on metaverse new techs and video games, we all agree on one side, and then we might even disagree, but we like discussing the, the details. That, that is the important thing. And I wanted to answer Pedro, because I mean, Pedro's first comment is actually a working definition of the metaverse, a collection of commercially rented buzzwords in order to grab investment. That could work as a definition of the metaverse, but this is a trick, and I have to say, I'm cheating. I'm I'm cheating a lot because the point that in video games we already experience most of this problematic is true. But thanks to this, probably thanks to someone remaining remaining renaming their company into something that sounds like metaverse, uh, mm -hmm. we we got a lot of attention and a public ready to listen to things that have been underlined by uh, academics and and and. and uh, I, don't, I was going to say freedom fighters. It's the wrong word, but then you know what I'm getting at. On people that are pointing out that sometimes, I mean, the entire ecosystem, when you have IP, uh, data protection law, competition law, consumer protection law, can create some environment that without a proper structure, legal structure, might be uh, a crux societal problem or create new one, create... Uh, I mean, digital poverty, we, we really don't need that. I mean, we, we are struggling solving the problem in the real world. Why are we imposing it in, in the moment? But when you start this conversation, you start to look at the legislation as today, you always run the risk of moral panics and, and regulation and amendment to the law that are caused by an article on a scandalistic newspaper published yesterday. The metaverse, it is an amazing opportunity to sit down and think properly about the, the, the big question and the structure that we want the future to have without risking to get into a politicized, sorry, and I'm, and I'm looking at the transcript, <laughs> politicization you. of our argument. S simple example, if you start discussing something like digital ownership as today, uh, based on you know streaming model, how creators get uh, uh, re remunerated by their creativity in a streaming environment in which there is no more transfer of ownership of support, you get into the today's business model and all the interests connected to this business model. If you project it in the future into something that like definition, but we we dream of it. I'm for Ready Player One. I want to have the Ready Player One <laughs> experience one day. It's going to take a couple of generations. We will probably never get there, but it helps us 
clarifying what the right questions are and how to better answer it without getting into the practicalities of today's business model. I've always been pushing and I mean, I've been pushing this argument since my PhD thesis on file sharing to tell you how old I am. <laughs> The problem is we have to look at an IP that can inform a positive business model. While sometimes the tendency is, is you create a business model and then you kind of lobby to have an IP that fits the business model that you wanted to have. And when you're looking at the old business model, it's very difficult for people that are basing their livelihood of a pre-existing model, uh, business model to just take like Tarz and the, the Lian and to jump into a new environment, dropping everything. So that's why we like to project the discussion in, 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 in the future. And it's fine now, because probably we failed on the internet. The, the, the dream of a decentralized internet is gone. The declaration of independence of the cyberspace. Wow, I call it the cyberspace. I used to call it the cyberspace. Things change, but it is an amazing time that we're talking about it now, before it happens. Mm -hmm. This is the right time to have this conversation. Great. So, and I'm so sorry, we basically are at our time, but I do want to give Andres one chance to have a final word here and basically wrap up for us on your thoughts on some of the topics raised uh, by our other fantastic experts. Andres? Yes, just uh, very briefly. Um, I think that probably what is going to happen with all of these subjects is that we'll end up using metaverse as a catch-all a catch term that doesn't really have a lot of meaning. When you think about the internet, for example, the internet is not really a coherent and cohesive space. It's things like file transfer protocols, it's email, it's all sorts of chat protocols that used to exist. Uh, uh, and so we ended up using the internet to refer to absolutely everything. So maybe the same thing we can do with the metaverse um, for just a want of a better term to define a loose um, number and a loose uh, set of protocols and uh, technologies that are going to interact uh, with one another. So maybe we'll end up having something like that. And the metaverse will be the best word to define all those things. So that's probably where I would end. Great. So thank you so much. And so sorry we don't have more time to discuss other important questions in the chat. I see a topic on gender equity that could be, certainly be its own uh, topic in this field. Um, but thank you so much to our amazing experts, uh, Gaetano, Micaela, and Andres, and of course, my colleague Richard, uh, for sharing all of your thoughts and experiences on this emerging topic with us, the video game sector at the time of NFTs and the metaverse. And let's all continue the conversation uh, offline and with the great links that have been provided to us in the chat. Looking forward to seeing everyone here in other contexts as the conversation continues. Thank you so much.